Can you hack your brain to let you count any number of items instantly? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sci vs. Sci, where we definitely never get busy and miss a week or a few of content. There's a scene in the movie Rain Man where Dustin Hoffman's character Raymond instantly identifies the exact number of toothpicks that fell out of a box. Today's topic is the ability to instantly identify specific numbers of items called subitizing. And it turns out it's a real phenomenon that you can already do. And I'll show you how. We often cover topics that we think will help expand on things you might hear in a psychology class, but there are a lot of interesting corners that you're unlikely to get exposed to even if you take many psychology courses. Today is one of those topics, and it sits at the foundation of how we understand numbers and math. I could do a whole series on numeric cognition, and if you're into that sort of thing, leave a comment and let me know. But if that sounds boring to you, I challenge you to stay tuned to this video before you decide. If you could look at your screen for a moment, let's do a mini experiment real quick. I'm going to flash up a number of dots on the screen, and without pausing, see if you can tell me the number of dots that you saw. Ready? Let's go. All right, how many dots did you see? If you got the answer four, you're correct. Let's try again. How many were there that time? Two. Good job. Okay, let's go one more time. All right, how many dots were there? Did you have a little more trouble with that one? If so, don't worry, you aren't alone. The correct number was 11. But think about your experience during this little test. You didn't have to sit there and count each dot. At those lower numbers, you just instantly knew. Now this is called subitizing, the ability to instantly identify a specific number of items or its numerosity. And this ability seems to be hardwired into your brain. But at some point, instead of knowing the exact number of dots instantly, the number of dots becomes a few or many or a lot without an exact number. There's a limit to your cognitive ability to subitize, and that's when a change in your attentional mechanisms has to happen. You have to start serially counting each item. For most people, under most experimental conditions, the maximum number that can be reliably subitized is four. Where this gets interesting is that there are people who have different subitizing abilities, and we may even be able to manipulate how much you can subitize. But once you start thinking about subitization and its limits, you might start seeing evidence of it all over the place, enmeshed in the foundations of cultures across the world. Subitizing allows you to determine numbers without actually having to understand the concept of number in the way that you learn it in math class, like on a number line. So why would we or other organisms have the ability to subitize at all? Why not just count? Being able to instantly assess number probably has some survival benefits. Counting requires sustained attention over time, a basic understanding of numbers, and other complex cognitive mechanisms that are likely to be time consuming and energy intensive, neither of which are beneficial in the life or death predator and prey environment where survival and reproduction depends on making quick decisions. Being able to determine that one or two lions is watching you versus many lions can help you determine your next move and whether you continue to contribute to the gene pool. The subitizing limit of four has been observed in many animals, including honeybees, whose brain of around a million neurons is tiny compared to the human 90 billion or so. But even for bees, keeping track of the number of flowers on a branch and how many competing bees there are could help guide foraging decisions. A bird instantly assessing the exact number of eggs in the nest might be important, and so on. Okay, well, if subitizing is so much faster, why limit it to four? Why not subitize everything? Well, there's a good reason for that, too. Our brain constantly has to balance its use of resources, getting the optimal amount of accuracy, speed, and energy expenditure. You may have heard the terms top-down and bottom-up processing to refer to how much we let our expectations guide our behavior and perceptions versus how much we pay close attention to the actual sensory stimuli we receive. Our sensory organs receive a constant stream of a large amount of sensory information, and a feature of our brains is to filter out a lot of that input and completely ignore it. If you want an example, find a video on something called inattentional blindness. Note to self, 
Make a video on inattentional blindness. The standard issue brain is designed to filter out and completely ignore much of that raw stream of stimuli that's coming in and only focus on things that are surprising enough to catch our attention. After all, it would be overwhelming if you constantly had to process every little repeated stimulus as though it were new. The sound of the air conditioner humming, the feel of a wrinkle in your sock pressing against your big toe, the smell of coffee someone brewed earlier in the day. However, there are people with non-standard issue brains where this filter is set differently, such that they notice all of that stuff far more potently than most people, and have trouble filtering out extra sensory input. Autistic individuals, for example, often have sensory sensitivities. It's even one of the diagnostic criteria used in clinical settings, and it's believed that stimming behavior, which sometimes could look strange or may even be harmful, is an attempt to help manage sensory overloads. Now, Research has repeatedly shown that most kids on the autism spectrum have no differences in subitizing abilities compared to kids with standard issue brains and have similar numeric competence at around age five. However, there are numerous reports of quote unquote savants who have extraordinary ability to instantly recognize numbers even over 100. Now, these are not well scientifically documented, even though some of them come from somewhat credible sources, like renowned neurologist Oliver Sacks. So this leaves the Rain Man story somewhat plausible, though unconfirmed. But if that's true, then it suggests that the costs associated with subitizing everything is constant sensory overload, possibly at the cost of precious cognitive resources. However, there is another angle we can explore. What if we could take anybody, any willing participant, and without doing surgery, manipulate their brains to temporarily enhance their subitizing ability? One research group reported that they can do exactly that, using a non-invasive technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Now, you might recall that our brains work in large part by using electrical impulses. Well, the source of that electrical potential is from charged atoms or ions that the brain uses to move in and out of the neurons to send signals around the brain. Now, see our video on action potentials for an example. You might also know that you can place electrodes on the scalp to measure changes in the electrical fields at certain brain areas. That's called an electroencephalogram or EEG. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, is kind of like a reverse EEG. Instead of reading the changes in the electromagnetic fields, you place a powerful electromagnet coil over a target area of the brain. Then you can send pulses that disrupt the normal activity of the brain in these target areas. In this study by Alan Snyder and colleagues, they took 12 volunteers and stimulated their left anterior temporal lobe on and off every second for 15 minutes. This brain area has been shown to be involved in savant-like abilities for both autistic savants and for people who have frontotemporal lobe dementias. So they gave people this temporary treatment, then tested their ability to guess how many dots were shown on a screen. The number of dots was way more than four. It varied between 50 and 150 items. The dots were only shown for a second and a half. Because people just tend to guess in multiples of five, they counted any answer within five of the correct answer as a hit. As a control condition, they had the same people come in and do a sham condition, where they moved the electrode around in exactly the same way to the same places, but never turned it on. What they report is that for up to an hour after TMS disruption of activity in this target area, there was a remarkable increase in the ability to estimate the number of items presented. Now, I've seen some YouTube channels where so-called neurohackers try and build DIY TMS coils and experiment on themselves, but that seems irresponsible for me to even bring up, even if it is entertaining. So I'm not going to mention that. Seriously, though, disruption of brain activity isn't the kind of thing I recommend DIYing, but I bet you can imagine some uses for temporary drug-free performance enhancement of this kind if we can find a way to do these things reliably and safely with a full understanding of the possible side effects. We're nowhere near that, so put down the soldering iron, put it, put it down, <laughs> there we go. A 2022 meta-analysis of similar TMS studies has identified a number of brain areas that are important to numeric cognition, such as the intraparietal sulcus, or IPS, 
which makes your ability to estimate quantities worse when you disrupt that area. The angular gyrus also works with the IPS in visual spatial representations of number in visual attention and short-term memory, as well as the supramarginal gyrus. Now these two areas are used in other visual spatial tasks, not specific just to estimating quantities, and are believed to be the areas responsible for the dream space that allows you to hallucinate and feel like you are in a place while dreaming during REM sleep. So these brain areas are part of a larger perception and attention system that has general purpose uses. Earlier, I made the bold claim that the foundations of world civilizations might be reflected in our sabotizing limit. And I feel like maybe I should provide some evidence for this, and maybe it will inspire you to keep an open mind for where you see groupings of four or fewer things in order to try and get around this processing limit. There are quite a few non-Western cultures around the globe that have limited language for numbers up to two, four, or five. And after that, they just have words for more or less, a lot or many. The philosopher John Locke wrote about a Brazilian tribe like this in 1690 that he had encountered, uh, but there are still groups like this today. The Paraha people of the Amazon and the Munduruku of Brazil are unique opportunities to study the influence of culture and language on numeric cognition. Hans Gross, who was one of the researchers studying subitizing in honeybees, noticed that many number representation systems around the world seem to represent the numbers 1 through 4 with a corresponding number of items, usually lines or dots. But this must change when you get to the number 5, probably because 5 lines is no longer subitizable. It just looks like a bunch of lines. We have many examples of these systems before Arabic numerals took over almost universally. Here are early Chinese symbols for number using lines, but when you get to 5, you get an X. South Arabia's system was similar with lines for 1 through 4 and a U to indicate 5. Across the globe, the Mayans used dots for 1 through 4 and changed to a line to represent 5. Vikings also used dots in their calendar up to the number 4 and then used a sideways V for 5. You're probably familiar with Roman numerals and probably seen them somewhere in the past week and didn't even notice, but the symbol for 1 is 1 line, 2 is 2 lines, and so on until you get to V for 5. Aha, you say, the Roman numeral 4 is IV, not four lines. Well, that's true, but if you look at historical use of their number system, it turns out that using IV to represent 4 is a relatively recent invention around the 17th century. I'll give you one guess how they wrote 4 before that. You can even find some clocks and fancy watches today that still use the older style, probably because it's easier to read. Well, what about things like dice that represent numbers with dots up to five and six? In this case, we've got another strategy that can help us learn the numbers, pattern recognition. The dots on a die aren't randomly arranged. They're always in the same pattern. This means you don't need to subitize. You can just learn the overall pattern and interpret it as a symbol for five or six. Ancient Egyptian numbers involved lines for 1 through 4, and then they used patterns of 2 plus 3 lines to indicate 5 and solve the problem. But this still shows that there was a problem to solve, doesn't it? More than about 4 items is hard to process. Do you see evidence of that limit around you? How has it shaped our lives and our cultures, perhaps in ways that we haven't ever even paid attention to or noticed? Let us know your examples in the comments. If you found this video useful, hit the like button. Subscribe to get more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. Studying for my math test. <laughs>